I'm a long-time Canberra resident uh, of this global village, this fantastic global village we call Canberra. I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm not a scientist and I'm not a policymaker. But what I do is I find good ideas and I provide the stewardship to make them happen. So I want to talk to you today about a great venture that I'm involved with. It has to do with climate change, it has to do with carbon, and it has to do with answering in part this question of what to do with CO2. Over the last six years, my Canberra team, Green Mag, and a group of Australian scientists from the University of Newcastle have been developing technologies to put CO2 into rock. This is not in holes in the ground that is proposed with geosequestration. This is into carbonates. And this is called mineral carbonation. Mineral carbonation fixes the CO2 into rock permanently. And we're proposing to use those carbonates in the building industry for new products of the future. Now, mineral carbonation is the same process that the Earth uses over geological time through weathering. What we're proposing to do is to speed that process up such that we're able to complete the atmospheric carbon cycle. So we've developed a lot of R&D, we've, we've developed some patents, and this week, after this six-year journey, we're signing agreements with the New South Wales government, the federal government, and an industrial partner in Orica to build the world's first mineral carbonation pilot plant in Newcastle. We're very excited about this. But it's important to remember that any solution to CO2 has a cost. And by standard economics alone, standard energy economics, there's nothing cheaper than putting CO2 in the atmosphere. That remains, and that has to change. So by the time we have our technology ready to store large amounts of CO2, we need that price in place. Otherwise, nothing will change. Now, we think that time is coming. Now, how do we start off with this notion of putting it into carbonates? Well, I'd like to talk to you about that journey, but also why it's important we store the CO2 away. And I'd also like to talk about what it means to have something like mineral carbonation as a solution in the future. Now, there are no silver bullets in storing CO2 and in dealing with our emissions. And mineral carbonation really just plays a part. It's part of a portfolio of technologies that are, are to be developed up, and we must prove whether they can work or not. It's very, very important that we do that. Now, strangely enough, the journey that I'll describe today is one that's taken me and my group six years, but in parallel, we've all taken the journey of discovering what it means to have and face climate change. So I want to talk about the real problem, which is CO2. Now, there's a lot of evidence that's been brought to bear in the last six years, and, and there's a lot of misinformation as well by vested interests in the climate change debate. So I think it's time for us to take stock of where we're at. And I'm reminded by a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Alan Snyder, who is a great uh, physicist and uh, neurobiologist. And he's always maintained that in science, there's kind of a reticence to accept uh, new evidence. And indeed, the way this manifests itself is how we see the climate change debate emerging. So when something new is discovered, they say it can't be true. And then when the evidence is brought to bear and the passing of time, they realise that it is true. And they say it can't be new, that this man made, you know, it's not, not true, it's happened before. When they realise that it hasn't, then they say it doesn't matter. There are other priorities. And when we apply this to the carbon and the, the climate change debate, we realise that we are now at that point. It is true, it is new, and it does matter for us and our children. Now, the problem is really big. We are emitting 31 billion tonnes of CO2. As you saw from that balloon before, it's a large amount, one tonne, 31 billion, but we are heading towards a trillion tonnes emitted since industrialisation, which is a massive amount, and it is having this effect that we are seeing. So what do we do about this? We won't get to the targets that we're setting ourselves unless we deal head-on with the issue. So we now know through the maturity of climate science that this is about warming and it's about the temperature increasing in the globe and the increase, increased amount of energy in the atmosphere. So we have a choice, two degrees, four degrees and six degrees, which one do you like? Um, all have their, uh, their challenges 
uh, but we are heading towards a six degree scenario if we don't do anything. So we know that fossil fuels are the main contributor and we do have to deal with those. But that's all I'm really going to say about the climate change science now. What I'd like to say is nobody likes coal. Coal is dirty, coal pollutes and it's non-renewable. And in fact the fossil fuels all fit into that category. But it's too easy to kind of sit with that view and call for climate change as we've heard previously. And we really need to actually understand what is likely to happen and what are the energy demands of the future. So the scale of our energy demand is really important to try and understand. And this graph you can see that the non-OECD nations are the ones that are really driving the uptake of new energy. And in fact, they will require twice as much electricity as they're currently generating in a 2040 time frame. Now, that's extraordinary because a lot of that is going to come from fossil. They are moving very rapidly towards renewables, but within the energy mix, we see that even on the best scenario of two degrees of warming, which we're unlikely to meet at this point, the US, India and China, uh, the biggest emitters by that time, will have around 30% or so mix of fossil fuels, which do have CO2 emissions. We need to deal with these. Unfortunately, we're probably going to get even more coal as well. So by this diagram, you'll see that over a thousand new plants are being proposed that are going to burn coal, and largely in India and China and the non-OECD nations, as I've mentioned. So this is uh, very unpalatable in that we need to deal with those emissions as well. So look, I don't want to talk about the problem anymore. I'd like to talk about the solution. That's really what I'm focused about and my group is focused about. So let's go back to a little bit of a basics here. And in fact, in, 1800, in the 1800s, coal saved the forests of Europe. It's kind of you know, hard to believe, but uh, we stopped felling trees and we, we stopped destroying the forests. So we were burning them at a rapid rate uh, as the industrialization started to kick on. So 200 years later, we now know that coal is unsustainable. And indeed, what will save coal? Now, I don't like the answer. We are proposing to burn trees again. It's called biomass. And the UK and Germany, strangely enough, are proposing large-scale biomass generation. I call this a perversion. When I was, present when I was preparing my talk, uh, my seven-year-old son, Hunter, came into my studio and looked on the screen and saw this slide. And he said, uh, Dad, you got it the wrong way around. And a seven-year-old can see that. Um, now, the perversion exists like this. There's, um, if you ask, are trees a way to store carbon renewably? We all say yes, we want as many forests as possible. They're the lungs of the earth. So the energy providers, the, the new energy providers, look at that and say, ah, well, trees can be used for energy. So you've said they're a renewable resource, so we now have a renewable energy resource. Now this is where the perversion lies, in the definitions and also in the distortions of the economics that we are now finding ourselves at by not dealing with the main problem, which, I which is our emissions. The answer is, give us as many renewables as possible. We know that. Now, Germany is to be commended in the way in which they've moved forward with solar. It's absolutely fantastic. They've set a record recently, which is equivalent to them having 20 nuclear reactors generating the equivalent electricity in a, in a midday section in, at, uh, when the sun was the brightest. Now, that's great, but when you look at what that achieved, it's only 4% of their actual generation capacity requirement. So we've really got to look at how quickly and, and, and really what renewables will do for us. So how did we arrive at our solution, mineral carbonation? We didn't have a eureka moment. What we did was we hunted it down. So we looked at what's available. What could we do um, with CO2? And my journey started when I met, uh, in 2007, an inventor who had an idea for getting magnesium out of desalination brines, a waste. Now, back in 2007, we were all concerned with water. There was water restrictions, we, um, you know, desalination plants were um, you know, being planned, and I thought this invention was you know, pretty good. The best thing about it was that it required CO2 to do that extraction. So I saw beyond the magnesium, and that kicked off the journey for us to understand 
how can you use CO2 as a resource? And that's really where we got to, and we started to think about, well, what does this need to be? So we thought it has to be scientifically feasible, and it can't be blue sky. We don't have enough time for blue sky thinking. We need to practically move forward incrementally to develop technologies. It's got to be big enough. The scale has got to meet the scale of the solution has to meet the scale of the problem. Very, very important. The other thing that we realise is that permanency is really important with CO2. It cannot be re-admitted into the environment. This is about storing it away. And the other thing that's close to all of us is that it has to be acceptable in terms of land use and competing interests such as food security. It's very, very important. We know that. We've seen that with the coal seam gas debate, for example. So where do we store this CO2? What kind of minerals could we put it into? So we, we looked at wastes. We looked at industrial wastes. And in fact, we presented uh, a, a research paper to Rio Tinto and had that peer reviewed. And they said, absolutely, you can put CO2 into these wastes, but you're only going to get rid of about 300,000 tonnes in Australia. And in, around the world, it's a kind of similar proportion. It's a small scale solution. So we had to look a little bit further. On the side, there's a lot of technologies being developed around using CO2 as fuel in algae and the like. And I'm fully supportive of that method to reuse CO2, except they are not large-scale CO2 mitigation solutions. At the end of that cycle, the CO2 still gets submitted, or it just holds it in a temporary loop. We actually need bigger solutions. So we actually went back to the Earth and said, what does it do? And when you look at where the Earth stores carbon, it's in the crust. In fact, 10% of the Earth's crust is a form of carbonate, magnesium carbonate. And so that's where we looked. And if you look at the scale, mineral carbonates are where it's stored in the form of carbonates. So in terms of scale and time frame, that is the largest place we could store it. So we just took the simple view of, well, if they end up as carbonates over geological time, what were they before they became carbonates? And we found this. Green magnesium, or what we call green mag. It's magnesium silicate, and it's highly available around the world. It's volcanic rock. And so what we've been looking at is how to speed up the process to absorb CO2 into that rock. So our proposal is to build plants like this around the world that would be sited near a place that had these rocks. They appear usually in outcrops. They don't compete with farming land. And what we would be doing is taking a feed of CO2 wherever we could get it. Remembering, this is a storage technology. We still need capture to happen. And capture is happening around the world, probably not as fast as we'd like, but we're hoping it will be available by the timeframes, the 2020 to 2030 timeframes, that we will need to roll these out if we are to sink that large-scale CO2. We could roll out 50 of these plants around the world, which could reasonably get rid of 1 billion tonnes of CO2 per annum. Now, we do expect that uh, coal-fire and gas-fire power stations and industry will be capturing its emissions. But what if they're being recalcitrant? What if industry isn't moving that quickly and we don't have the right stimulus in place? So one exciting eventuality is that Richard Branson has put up the Virgin Earth Challenge and recently they've named 11 finalists. Five of those are proposing to capture CO2 ambiently from the atmosphere. So immediately in the future we could be citing this kind of capture where the minerals existed and actually detaching from where the source of the CO2 was. So in a future scenario, we could be sinking that carbon in New South Wales, in Australia, overseas, from the Chinese and Indian fossil fuel generators. So it's a very exciting prospect. So I really want to just kind of sum up where we're at and what I've talked about today. We need a price on carbon across the globe, and we need that to be a realistic price. So nothing is cheaper than emitting CO2. 
We've taken six years to get to this stage, and it's going to take a few years more. Our pilot plant project is over a four-year period, and we hope to have developed up the technology to scale by then. So we've, we've got a few supporters now in our approach, but we also have some detractors. And going back to that conversation I had with the coal industry early on, we followed that conversation along, and by the time we got to this stage, we'd won government funding first. We'd won federal government and state government funding. And then we went back to the coal industry and said, well, we've proven this up in the lab. We've proven it up on reasonable scale. Now it's time for an industry partner. And unfortunately, they said that we don't meet their definition of storage. Their definition of storage is geosequestration. Well, that's fine as an entrepreneur, as I am in my group. We walked around that decision and looked for an industry partner that was capturing their CO2 already and actually recognised the problem, which we found Orica and brought them together. We formed Mineral Carbonation International, and as I say, our agreements are to be signed this week, and we'll make announcements in a couple of weeks' time. Now, there are no silver bullets in CO2, as I say, so this is just one of the portfolio of opportunities for us in abating CO2. Now, we are facing the classic conundrum. We are trapped between a rock and a hard place when dealing with our CO2 emissions, but we think the answer may well be in rock. Thank you.